I want to take a text and then illustrate it from another part of the Bible. And for some, it might be strange to hear me talk about this. If you were at the retreat, then you heard the first part of this. And if you remember, um, then I announced at the retreat that this coming February, I would, will have been preaching for 70 years. And I got so taken up with that, um, I told everything that happened in the 70 years. We never did get, get to this. And so it is in Isaiah chapter 26, and it reads in verse 3, the steadfast of mind you will keep in perfect peace because he trusts in you. And that is quite an amazing statement. Um, it, first of all, it's a verse that is written in a certain Hebrew fashion. When the Hebrews spoke, they, they would say something and then say another thing that would be the same thing but illustrative of it. Uh, we would read that as a person who has a mind set on God, a steadfast mind, and then we would say, and he's a person who trusts in you. Whereas the Hebrew way of saying it is a steadfast mind is trusting in you. And it brings the two together. And that is fascinating to me because it's this word mind. It's translated from the Hebrew language as mind. But I'm, I'm, in my opinion, it shouldn't be. Um, because every other time this word is used in the Bible, it's translated as it should be as imagination. And it is saying that the person whose imagination is stayed or locked into God is the person who is trusting in God. And I, I find uh, continually people who do not, they don't get it as to how one trusts in God. And, and they're trying to trust in God with the left-hand side of their brain. And it's a mere intellectual matter. Whereas the scripture, and this is the one verse that says it so plainly, you don't trust God with the left-hand side of your brain. You dance with God on the right-hand side of your brain. You trust God in the area of imagination. And that is um, shocking to many people. Um, because Christians aren't supposed to talk about imagination. But the fact is, if I only have trust as some intellectual trying to believe, uh, then I have something that is, it's a religious magic wish. And I'm saying words, but they have no echo inside my real self. And I have no expectancy of anything happening but I'm simply saying it in some, I say again, religious, religious magic kind of way. Um, I look at the impossible and I say some very spiritual Christian words, but I, nothing happens and I'm going nowhere because I'm leaving out this vital part of our very existence. We can't live without imagination. Imagination, everybody here this morning, is because you imagine getting here. Um, if, if you've been here before, you imagined the road you'd be taking, you imagined the time you'd be here. The whole thing took place in your imagination. You think in pictures and, and um, you anticipate the immediate future totally in pictures. And, and um, when, when you bake your Christmas cookies, you, you, it's imagination. You see, you see the cookies before you start. It's, it's how we work. It's part of being human. It is that something that is uniquely godlike in us to be able to see what is not and, and to then go from what is not to bring it into being. And as I see it as that which is not, I actually have feelings that actually affect my, my body that I can see it and feel it even though it's not here yet. It's imagination, but we do it all the time and don't even recognize what we're doing. Because I say again, it's part of being human. 
And part of being human, it's neutral. So imagination can be used in very devilish ways. Uh, One of the greatest imaginers of the 20th century was Hitler, and um, did it purely by imagination, uh, seeing what was not to to bring it to pass with, with blood and horror. But on the other hand, the Bible makes it very plain that we take these neutral parts of ourselves. I mean, my hands are neutral. My tongue is neutral. It can be used either way. And it says that our neutral members, it calls the members, are, are, are made to be one with Christ through the Holy Spirit. And that releases this enormous power that is pent up within us. Um, and I, I believe only religion um, could, could disallow the, this enormous power within us, tying our hands and saying that uh, Christians don't use their imagination. Um, th- this man that is talked about here, or this woman, it's a person who's locked into God. It said his imagination, his mind there, but it's the imagination. It said he stayed upon you. It's an interesting word, stayed. Uh, if you grow tomatoes, you know what it is. You put a cage over the tomatoes so that they can be held up. And, and they're being, that's the word, stayed. They're held up. And, and therefore, the vine that goes on the trellis is held up by the trellis. And therefore, the strength of the trellis becomes the strength of the vine. And, and the strength of the cage becomes the strength of the tomatoes. Uh, that's the word. It says your imagination is stayed or locked into or resting into the, the God that you're, you're set upon. And I say again, only when we found that whole area of life in terms of the Holy Spirit can we begin to know what trust is. Up until then, it's that religious magic stuff. Um, Imagination, again, I'm using the the word in the Bible language, Hebrew, it it is the making place. It is the place where you put certain material in and then imagination does its wonders and, and it makes. And so it takes what you know and produces something in the end where you've never been yet. It, it, it can take that which is presently not like your cookies. Presently they're not. But imagination can take what presently is not and not only begin to move toward it, but also you experience with your senses, your feelings, as being already present. And I've used the illustration before of tell the children they go into Disney World, and of course they had brilliant at imagination, and it takes over, and in their imagination, they're not only moving toward Disney World, they're already there, and they actually have the physical feelings of being there, and, and sometimes I think they enjoy the imagination of being there than when they really get there. It, it's, it's, this, this is the imagination that speaks of things that are not as though they are. And remember, that's a verse from Romans chapter 4 that describes who God is and how he works. The things that are not as though they are. And imagination never tells you how you're going to get there. You have an image of being there. You have an image of the finished cookie. You've got an image of being in Disneyland. But how you get there it sort of fades into insignificance. If you can keep the picture, you'll be there. If you, if you can hold the picture in your mind, it, you will be guided and drawn toward that place. And, and Jesus spoke continually in his own life and ministry. He says, the hour is coming and now is. So he said, that which historically is coming is already here in, in terms of uh, I've seen it, I've tasted it, and, and I'm being drawn toward it. And so imagination is tomorrow's possible. And I've seen it, I've tasted it, 
and I'm moving toward it. Um, I think it was Einstein that called it the preview of coming events. It's what you see in the movie house for trailers of movies that are not yet, but you, here's a bit of it. Uh, and that's our imagination. It, it's the seedbed of tomorrow's flowers. And it, it's, always, it's always happening. I say it again, this is the way humans work. And it's the key to meditation, biblical meditation, not the Eastern brand, but um, in, in meditating in the biblical sense, we actually see ourselves in the scripture. So you, you know how it goes. You can memorize the scripture uh, and get all those pins in Sunday school, but, but it's, it's a dead thing. So you memorized it. I memorized the you know, 10 times table. It, it's, you can, it's not memorizing. It is actually entering into the scripture and seeing yourself there to the point where you feel yourselves there. And, and that then feeds into the story you tell yourself of who you are. We, that's another thing that is natural to every human being. We tell ourselves a story of who we are. And um, in, in that story, we've got an eye on the end and we're moving toward it. And we're continually telling ourselves a story. It's as if new chapters every day that we tell us. And, and, and so imagination, it turns that story into a living movie that I see myself. I see myself in scripture. I see myself in terms of my relationship to God. It's not a dead thing. It, it says in Proverbs, as a man thinks in his heart. And that's the same idea, thinks there as imagination. It's as a man thinks in his heart, so he is. Hasn't done anything yet in, in terms of activity, but thinks in his heart, imagines himself to be so he is. I think I've said before, um, if you get a promotion in work, that means absolutely nothing until you can imagine yourself in your new position. You know, if they make you a supervisor and you walk through the place looking like someone data entry, um, no one will respect you. But you, you, you've got to see yourself. And when I see myself as a supervisor, that sends out an energy that everybody can taste and feel. And that's just being human. That's the way it is. And that's why the scriptures say, keep your heart, which is another word for that area of the imagination, Keep your heart with all diligence. Out of it are the issues of life. You today are the belated announcement of what you've been imagining yourself to be for the last 10 years. It, 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 we become, it's the way it is. And for those who have a real problem that the Bible speaks so much about imagination, let me say one more thing, and that is in the New Testament, which speaks directly to where we are today, uh, the word imagination is linked to the word hope. Give us thought about that, that hope in the scripture. And again, uh, I, not the word as it's used today, when we just give that hangdog look and say, all we can do is hope. I don't mean that. Um, I mean the biblical meaning of the word hope means a passionate desire, expectation of actually obtaining some good, a good end. Uh, hope that my expectation shall be fulfilled. But along with that, the word is defined with envisioning a good outcome. True biblical hope sees. It, it doesn't say. It, it's saying arises out of seeing. But I see that good end. I see that. And, of course, now we're back to where I started. That is rooted in trust. Now, now I trust God because I'm actually seeing God at work in my life. I'm seeing him doing this, doing that, being this, being that. It's not simply left-hand brain trying to convince myself. It's rather I have gone into this other realm which doesn't always work with the intellect. Um, it, it, it's, as I said, you never know how you're going to get there, but, but you see and you trust. And um, th this is 
where this verse is in its place in Scripture. It is saying that, that the man whose imagination is linked in, locked in with God, that is the man who trusts God. And so his life works end. Now, I want to illustrate that with something I did about a year and a half ago, but I've been meditating on that for the last year and a half. And that is imagination as it is used with certain characters of the Bible. We could do this to almost every character of the Bible, but the one, the story you know most of all is that of David and Goliath. And it's in 1 Samuel chapter 17. And in that chapter, it's almost spelled out the imagination, the, the powers, the, or shall I say, the, the energy fields of imagination that were working there, which is where every one of us are at. It's where we're at. You have the three main players. You've got, of course, Goliath. He dominates the entire chapter in one sense. Uh, and then you've got Saul, the king of Israel, and all the army that followed him. He's a pathetic character, and um, he, he hardly appears in the chapter, even though he should have been the most important person. But then you have David, and each one of them were who they were, positive or negative, by their imagination. If you want to get yourself in history, it was about 1000 BC when all of this took place. And let, let, let's look at it. You know, Goliath, he gets out of bed that fateful morning when all this went down. He'd probably been dreaming of crushing Israel and grabbing their land. That was the reason they were there. And, you know, it. People look at it as a, almost a fairy story, but he, he was around 10 feet tall and proportionate in his body. I, I In Africa, I've seen tribes of nine feet and more. Um, th th this is not stuff for Grimm's fairy stories. This is a real character. And th these monstrous people seem to be around in these early days. Uh, his armor... Uh, probably, certainly custom made, probably he designed it. But we have records in history of the armor of these characters, that they had bronze armor that they polished uh, and made sure they stood before their enemies with the sun shining right on them, which meant that you couldn't really look at them because of the um, reflection of the sun. They wore something like an Indian headdress, which made them even taller than they were. And um, with this, this man, his armor alone weighed 126 pounds. And it says the tip of his spear, not, not the handle, just the tip of his spear weighed 15 pounds. Uh, and this monstrous character, in the darkness of his mind, his absolute trust in himself in, in terms of his enormity and his powers horned out over the years and believing in the great lie that dominates the darkness, you shall be as God. And he sees, and I'm not saying that word casually now, see, he imagines, he sees Israel as insignificant totally so, helpless, it's all he can see of them. They're, they're wimps, they're useless, they're ready to be crushed underfoot. And in his mind, he's already shaped the outcome. He's already seen and felt. He's already tasting that goal for which he's there, which is to crush Israel. And, and he was the one that came up with the plan now, why, why have a whole battle between two armies? He was the one that said, I'll go out and challenge. Give me a man and let's have a fight. And the winner takes all. Um, he came up with all that. He'd savored this moment for months. 
which brought about the invasion of these Philistine people. And every morning he would go to right up to the Israeli army, right almost touching distance. You could smell his stinking breath. And as he came, he would challenge, announce this, that any man, you send me a man, let us fight and finish this between us. Every morning, every morning, go there and stand there and shout. He'd been doing it for six weeks every day. And he came up every morning and every evening, that's 84 times he had confronted the whole army of Israel and they'd all cowered before him and shown their weakness, their helplessness, their sheer terror, and they'd run before him. And he would go back to the barracks of the Philistines and they would laugh at it and mock these stupid Israelis. That was Goliath. And he lived there waiting for that which he'd already tasted in his imagination. The crushing of these people and we take over and get our land and their wealth. Okay, on the other side of the valley is Saul in his royal tent. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of use that gave him. He hasn't slept all night. His mind is turning and turning and turning in anxiety, nightmares, how all of this is inevitably going to come to an end. I mean, how long can you keep this up? Six weeks, 84 challenges. How long do you do it? And out in the tents, over breakfast, every soldier who has likewise tossed and turned all night They talk of their expectancies and their fears. You know how you do that. They all rehearsed one to another the greatness of Goliath and maybe exaggerated a little because they've got to justify their fears. You know what I mean? They're they're going to talk him up and they're going to say when they got close enough to see and he's bigger than you think and he's more powerful and on and on. It was the... You see, Israel's imagination, and this is where it gets interesting. What was in Israel's imagination? They were passive. And that's in, actually most people are. They're passive to receive any image that's floating around. So Goliath's imagination is so specific, it is so... What should I say? Powerful is not really the word I'm looking for. It was an energy that went out. And here Israel stands there with this passive flip-flop imagination and they are sitting there ready to receive the images that are coming to them through Goliath. It was a terrifying sight. If you put a 10-foot fellow in a brass armor with a headdress, Of course, it was a terrifying sight. And I can understand that, naturally speaking, they lost all courage and lost all hope. The one verse that sums it up, 1 Samuel 17, he says, when they heard the words that Goliath spoke, they were dismayed, greatly afraid. They fled from before him. They were greatly afraid, and their hearts failed. Uh, Yeah, I get the message. They, They were terrified. Imagination, before anybody's touched anything physical, if it is used by the power of darkness, is a terrifying power. Terrifying. Much more powerful than tanks and bombs and anything else. Just imagination that is honed and directed. Terrifying power. It's the very energy of darkness. And these people were so terrified, they assumed Goliath's imagination as their own. You think about that. It was easy because their mind didn't have any, it was an unused imagination. They had no thoughts about it. They they were there because they'd been drafted. Now we're here, we've got to take whatever comes. So they didn't have an imagination that was actively used, and it just sat there. 
and Goliath transmitted his imagination to theirs so that Israel now has no imagination bigger than Goliath's. You, you should really think about that in the world we live today. We have spent the last two years mostly sick of imagination more than actual disease um, because we, we are a people today in the 21st century that have very little positive imagination. We, we are led like um, bulls with a thing in his nose um, by commercials and, uh, and we imagine what we're told to imagine and we simply do CNN and Fox News over and over again in our heads. It's, we're just sitting ducks and it's the same here. That they tuned in every morning to the newscast from 84 times. The six o'clock news and the, you know, Goliath came and they listened, transmitted. They had forgotten their true identity. Um, in, in Deuteronomy chapter 20, which uh, we have no time to go to, but it lines out that when enemies come against you, uh, step back. The Lord said, the battle is the Lord's. It's not yours. I'll take care of you um, and, and no need. But it also says, very interesting, that um, if anybody's afraid, please go home quickly because you're just like a rotten apple in the barrel. And um, in fact, if your mind is on another job, and you're, you're building a house, or you've just got, please, please go home because your mind is somewhere else. But anyone who can trust and imagine the reality that God is my bodyguard, God is my shield, he does my battles, then hang because it, even if there's only one of you left after everybody's gone home, that's enough. I, I'll, I'll protect you. That was their identity, the people that God protected. They'd forgotten it completely. Um, and imagination only works with the ideas and thoughts that we give to it. And, and so that's all they had to play with, that um, they don't know who they are. They're here just like a bunch of drafted soldiers to try and protect their land. Whereas Goliath comes with this enormous specif uh, specific imagination. The, the, these people had not progressed very much. Back in Numbers 13, they, you know, do you remember when Israel came to the land of Canaan? Well, the land of Canaan had a lot of these characters. As I say, you find them, and it's another subject altogether, but they, they were a unique sort of race within the race of gigantic people. And when Israel came into Canaan, they saw this whole mass of gigantic people, and they very, I mean, their imagination was very vivid. They said, we are like grasshoppers in their sight. Now, of course, they didn't go up to them and say, how do you see us? That was their imagination that looked at themselves and looked at these guys, and they said, in their eyes, we look like grasshoppers. And because we look like grasshoppers in our eyes, so we are <coughs> and that is how they think about us. Now, that was an absolute lie. <coughs> they, they were not thinking of them like that at all. But that's what imagination said. And they ran away, never to go back into the land of Canaan. <coughs> they walked, they talked, they acted like grasshoppers. Well, that was quite a time ago. Now, here's another one shows up. And how do the people, they, they know not advance. They still see themselves as grasshoppers. And they still run away. I suppose I could ask you, what did your imagination have for breakfast this morning? <clears throat> what, you know, who, who's feeding your imagination? What causes you to anticipate what's going to happen tomorrow <coughs> and the next day? It's Goliath's imagination united with their 
empty, nothing imagination, and forgetting that they were God's people, God's covenant people, that produces energy field of darkness in which they already just surrendered and said it's only a matter of time. And so every morning, it's a crazy sight, you know, every morning two armies face each other. And it says, and it's one of those things that you, you they did what? No, every morning, every morning, Israel, the armies of Israel came forward and shouted a battle cry. 84 times. And then within a few minutes of shouting the battle cry, turned around and ran away. Um, it reminds me of many people who, they call it confessing the scripture. Um, you know you know what I mean? They, they will confess a promise. They will say it over and over and over again. Um, sort of a self-hypnosis. It's a battle cry. But they're not doing it from their imagination. They don't see it. I, I put it like this. You pray for someone to be healed, but you're imagining them sick. You, you, you pray for your own situation, but you're still anxious, running the movie inside your head of nothing happening. That's this. They, they could shout the battle cry. Oh, sounds great but then immediately turn around and run because in their imagination, they'd already seen Goliath crash them. Do, do you follow what I'm saying? It's, um, you know, the shout the battle cry one more time. Maybe it will work this time, you know. No, I just made fools out of them. The very sight of Goliath, they, their imagination picked up his imagination. They had joined in his agenda for their own destruction. Yeah. And it was a herd mentality. They all ran together. It was a united imagination. It says in Genesis 11 that if a person can imagine, then they can do anything that they imagine. Do you remember that? Well... These people all imagined the same thing, which was Goliath's imagination. And um, so it was a herd. They all, have you ever seen it? We, we often see it in our front yard um, when, when the deer come and, and they'll all be just, you know, lollygagging, is that the Texas word? Um, uh, but they're, they're all eating the grass, you know, you know. And suddenly one of them, you know, they put up their white tail and we, they're all they got. And it's very obvious, they have no idea why, but they're all running because one of them gave the alert. That, that's it, it's the herd imagination. Um, the, the, these people, come on Israel, as we know them in the Old Testament, they were inheritors of, of this land and now they're drowning in another's imagination. Fear is transmitted so quickly. I might have told you the story before of when I was in Moscow before the wall came down. And, um, well, I, I can't go into the details. It'll take too long. But the, the, in, in, in Russia, in Moscow, I, I watched as it must have been a thousand people lined up outside of a door since before dawn because the rumor had it there was some meat in there and they waited and waited until the door opened and 10 people allowed in to grab what piece of meat there was and you would find that all over Moscow people lining up in their thousands and just standing like zombies and there was this sense of fear on the streets anxiety of dismay despair that you could taste. It was, I've never been quite like it. And when I got back to my room, I found myself entertaining thoughts of despair and hopelessness. I thought, where the heck did this come from? It, it's, it's out there on the street. It's an energy. It's an imagination. Um, 
Isaiah speaks about it, but the, it, it says the Lord spoke to Isaiah and says, do not fear what they fear. Do not dread what they dread. Um, the message says, don't be like this people, always afraid of somebody's plotting against them. Don't fear what they fear. Don't take on their worries. And it is, it's a mass thing. And, and, and with the way we're set up now with social media as well as um, TV, the, the whole country is controlled by, by ideas of darkness, fear, anxiety. They, these people were already living in Goliath's imaginary future, which for them meant fear, it meant dread, despair. There's no hope. There are paralyzed victims. Okay, that went on for six weeks, 84 times. Enter David. Now, David, by it's not too easy to say how old he was, but um, every scholar and everything you work out from Scripture, he was between 14 and 15 years old. Um, and, and he lived basically on the hills with the sheep, as was common in those days. And his, he was too young for the draft, you see. And, and so his dad said, you know, I want you to take these cookies to your brothers and here's some cheese for their commanders and, and I want to know how the battle's going. There was no CNN. There was no, all they knew, there was a battle. They'd been drafted. What's going on? I don't know, six weeks. We should hear something. And David is, and it, it comes out very clearly when he gets there, he, he's full of expectation that God is doing Deuteronomy 20. Da David obviously knew that because he is understanding the battle is the Lord's. God is protecting us. These people came trying to, to take our property. God's going to look after us. And so this 14-year-old, 15-year-old is just dancing. It's, I can't wait to see how God has done this. It never occurs to him what is actually happening. He, he's, he's expectant. He's excited. And, and so if you, if you want to feel it with him, he's getting up at 4 o'clock in the morning from where David lived in Bethlehem, only he was up in the hills a bit, um, from there to where the battle was being fought in the Valley of Elah was exactly the same mileage as from here to Pipe Creeks where you turn off on 46. It was 15 miles from Bethlehem. And to us that, of course, is nothing. But if all you've got is two legs, it's, it's enough. You don't go very far. And, and this boy gets up before dawn and he's running, and Bethlehem, very much like we are, was up in the hills, and, and so he's running downhill as fast as he can toward 46, and um, because that's where the battle is being fought. And so the sun is rising in the morning sky by the time he gets there. I mean, normally we can walk, if we're in good shape, about three miles an hour but he was leaping, he was running, and um, covered that 15 miles, totally unprepared for the crisis that he walked into. You gotta realize that. Um, but he is totally different to any of the other persons there, beginning with King Saul and all the way through the soldiers. This, this kid is totally different. You could say he's the lone alone, the truth imaginer. Um, he is bringing into this paralyzed camp God's imagination of what's going on. He was seeing God where everybody else saw Goliath. And he knew his identity and he knew that God said he would protect from any enemies. And that immediately began to spread in the camp. Soldiers gathered around him. 
and because he heard, he got there perfect, I mean, timing. He got there just as the great brute came out uh, and began his 85th challenge. David looked around, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed. Which one of my brothers will be the first one to go out there and face him? And then the sick story came out that this has been going on for six weeks and no one's gone out there. And then he begins and there's never, a, in all that he said, there's never a hint of thinking that we could ever lose this. God is with us. What, what are we doing standing here and letting him talk like that? He's insulting God. What are you doing standing here and letting him do that? We are transmitters. I mean, I've just said that about fear. We transmit fear, but we also transmit and radiate. We, we are a living broadcasting tower. What we see and imagine, it comes out in every word we say. It comes out in the looks on our face. It comes out in the blink of an eye. It's, we, we are transmitters, like it or not. You can never hide who you really are. It, it's coming out. And he was radiant with hope. He was like sun rising. The sun of covenant love was rising on this camp. And, and, and there's a new possible being presented to this stale, paralyzed situation. And it wasn't because he had suddenly prayed and, and said, you know, well, that's what you hear, isn't it? When there's a crisis, we've got to pray about this. Well, you should have done that before. He, he was ready, and he, he didn't have to skip a beat. He, this is, it, was, it was normal to him, okay? It was a natural. This was not a special day to him. Think about that, 15-year-old. It's not a special day that he's suggesting go out and face the monster. He saw all of life. This is how David saw life. He saw the events of every day through the lens of God's covenant love and promises. His mind, his imagination was stayed, held up by God who trusted. And so he sees what's in front of him as the opportunity for the God of covenant to show that he is really alive, he's really there. This relationship that he had with God is his base camp. It's his magnetic north. To him, the covenant was not an historical past, but it was remembered into this present moment. And he meditated. That's why he wrote most of the Psalms. You know, this 15-year-old He's 15 years old, and every time you look in the Psalms, it's that 15-year-old now grown up, but he's doing the same thing. He's meditating. It's, it's Joshua 1.8, and, and Joshua was told, meditate uh, on this book um, of the law. Do not let it depart from your mouth, but meditate on it day and night. That is a fascinating I could spend another hour just on that. It's See, Eastern meditation is empty your mind. Biblical meditation is fill your mind. Um, and fill your mind with what God says. But meditation means to chew the cud. You know, you've, you've seen the, the cows and sheep. They, they bring, they regurgitate food and they chew it again and they swallow and then they regurgitate and chew it again. Uh, that is meditation. It is go into what God has said and letting it percolate through your whole being with no sense of time. It's not saying I do this for six days. It is I just uh, I meditate. And um, the way the Hebrews did it, because they didn't, know too much about silent thinking. That came on much later in history where you could think without opening your mouth uh, or pray without opening your mouth or read without opening your mouth. In these early days, they always spoke. And so the, the word meditation means 
to let it percolate to the point where you are muttering to yourself about it. But you are muttering and talking to yourself about what God is saying in his promises. And so it says, this is fascinating to me, he says, don't let, you, you read something in the scripture, don't let it depart your mouth. Don't, you, you'll talk to yourself about it, but don't let it go out of your mouth. But keep on meditating until it has become you. And you are ready to demonstrate the life of this in, in ordinary life. Um, I, I find people today talk too quickly. They, they think they see something and blab about it, and they don't know a thing about it. And they're just blabbing. It would be better keep your mouth shut. Do not let it depart your mouth. Keep a hold of it and let it go back into you until you have become that. And, and so with David, the scripture says that Lord, which is the unfortunate translation of that you know, Hebrew word, Yahweh, which means I am. God is I am. A and God says, I am your strength. I am your wisdom. I am your protection. I am your shield. Well, when David meditates and he came out as I am is my, do you see what I'm saying? It's no longer a general truth, but it is something that has become David. And now he boldly states it. It is, it is me. And of course, you're meditating and imagining at the same time. You cannot say, God the I am is my strength without imagination which is usually in symbols to us but it would be I'm seeing myself that that's this kid he walks into the camp and all he can see is himself endued with the strength of God to the point where I don't think about it anymore it just is and it's bigger than that character out there his imagination had, had seen himself, given himself a true identity of who he was. He, he's the person that God's speaking about in Deuteronomy. It's no longer Deuteronomy. That's me he's talking about. And so many times we, we talk about Scripture like we know it, and we've hardly read it, but we, we, we speak it without any sense of what it means or where it's placed in life and before I have any sense that it's talking about me. And so it becomes a formula, left brain stuff, just say it. A disembodied speech in a sound, in the void, an empty hope. But no, this is trusting. I see myself as God sees me. I see myself as God knows me. And I rest in that. It is so. And he trusted. Which meant there were a number of negatives going on because he never thought, he never thought that God was judging Israel. He never thought this is punishment for something Israel has done. No, it didn't occur to him. Never thought that he'd been abandoned by God. It never occurred to him that a 15-year-old shepherd was unworthy to do such a never consider all that tripe you know it's just it's all religious nonsense it's destroyed people no he ne never thought of it like that nor did he think that there was some secret will of god that god said this in scripture but you know him he's got a secret will he, so we have to religious again whine if it be your will or oh shut up God said it, David meditated, imagined, he became it. That was the end of it. I don't have to question God anymore. That's the way it is. There's not a contradictory will that's against the revealed will. There's not another God hiding behind Jesus to come Halloweening out of us, you know. Um, 
In his imagination, he saw a future with God keeping his word. And he had a pantry in his imagination full of the times when God had done that. He had plenty to go back on and say, I know God is with me on this occasion, on that occasion. And you remember he said that when the lion came to get my sheep, well, he said, the Lord was with me. I went and faced the lion and rescued my sheep. Yeah. And so, as I say, he was not laboring to get to an end. He, he was not going through the details of this is what should be done to Goliath. He, it's a done deal. That man's going to be flat on his face within the hour. I don't know how it's going to happen. That's not my business. You know. Imagine the end. He saw that Goliath was the enemy of God's people seeking to destroy everything that God had given. Well, I don't have to pray about that to see if it's God's will that this monster is put out of the way. <laughs> no. As I said, it's not a special day. It's, not a spe it's just another day of seeing that covenant works. God is who he says he is. And Goliath is just another foolish enemy who's trying to fight with God. And there's no special prayer, no great repentance. It's just a 15-year-old kid. And you remember Saul tried to put on him the armor, not the craziest. You know. And David said, no, I've got my shepherd's sling. I've got my shepherd's club. Let me get out there. I... This, you're, you're making it a special event. It's not a special event. He said, I've been through this before. He said, lions and bears come to take my sheep. But the, he said, there's never a thought in my head that I've got to pray, is it your will that the sheep are killed? You know, He says, I'm the shepherd. I'm the protector of these sheep. And I go out and the Lord goes ahead of me and the Lord is with me and I defeat them. He said, this isn't a special day. So a lion today, a bear yesterday, now this Goliath today. It's just the same principle. The lion must go. Goliath must go. I have no other thoughts about the matter. Never a thought that God might not come through. And, and he's passionate about it. Enough that the whole army is soon talking about what's happening to that kid. And they're gathering around him, you know, and he's sharing his excitement of, of what God would do with this man. And, and, and the assurance is catching, you know. He doesn't see himself as part of Goliath's agenda. Goliath is part of his agenda. It's the only way. And so he was prepared for this the same way as it was in, when you think of, you know, we talk about the lion and the bear, <clears throat> well, that was part of his daily work. His factory floor <clears throat> was looking after the sheep. And so <coughs> what had happened there um, in his daily work, um, and he uses an expression, and again, I'd like to spend a lot of time on it, but he said, David said, the Lord has delivered Goliath into my hand. I don't know. I like that. It so I mean, it sounds like a gift. He's delivered Goliath into my hand. It was a gift indeed that David was going to be in the middle of a demonstration of covenant faithfulness. And of course it's how he looked at life. It's how he would say later on in the Psalms, I am is my strength, whatever. And so now this event, God's delivered him into my hand. So I'll see now a yet a further undreamed of boundary of that revelation. I'm going to see what God can do here, which will only add to my resume of 
you know, it's a gift. He didn't see it as a fight with Satan. He's not one of those people, you know, casting out demons at every flip of the coin. Um, no, God has given him a gift and said, handle, you know. So God was in this as well as delivered it to his hands. It was almost, say, I'm putting it in your hands. You know how to handle this. Um, there was somebody in the hospital last week, and um, so I called Andrew, and I, and I said, you know, they're in the hospital. A and Andrew's response was, I'm on it. That's it. I delivered that into his hands. He said, I'm on it. You know. And um, that's how... Do, do you follow what I mean? The, the things that happen in life, God delivers them into our hands. You, you know enough to handle this. You, know, it's, you trust in me. You imagine yourself in me and me in you. You, you know how to handle it. And one last thing, it's fascinating to me when he went, he was now finally, the king wants to know who this 15 year old is and takes him to the royal tent. And, and when he's there, it's how he comes, a 15 year old boy, and, and he doesn't see himself as a superior Superman. You see, he's operating within this, shall I say, atmosphere of the love of God, covenant love. And, and God's love never demeans anybody. God's love ever, never shames anybody. And here you've got the king, and he doesn't know what to do. And of all people, he should have memorized Deuteronomy. He should have known what to do now. He doesn't. And he's floundering. Enough that he's actually going to listen to what a 15-year-old kid is saying. And, well, the whole army out there, they don't know where they're at either. And he's one, one boy who does. If he had been trusting in himself he would have been proud to the max. Look, I'm the only one here who knows what's going on. Call yourself a king, for goodness sake. No, you, you don't have it. it. Rather, he sees himself as a servant of everybody. And he says to the king, he says, look, don't let your heart fail. I'll go and handle this. And I, the, the, the army, they don't know what to do. That's okay. I'll do it for them. And the whole attitude is not shaming them, but rather saying, I'm the servant. I will go and handle this for you. Because obviously you don't know which way is up. And so let me do it for you. He represented, literally, all Israel. Because he represented, the king should have been the one going out there. He represented the king. He represented every soldier that cowered before the voice of Goliath. He represented thousands of little cottages and hamlets all over Israel that wouldn't know we'd lost until the Philistines came to take them. He represented people who didn't even know his name. And he did so with excitement, not with despising others. If ever a person was alone, when he stepped out of the ranks of the army, and by this time, this, this Goliath, remember, <coughs> 127 pounds of armor on him, He's not moving very fast, and he's turned around. And um, when I was in Israel, we, we went to the Valley of Elah, 
and we we played and, and split the people you know you're Israel you're and, and the space that you know Goliath had to turn around and lumbering in in that armor back to the Philistine lines David had heard him shouting and had gone through the whole thing with the king and now he goes out and Goliath isn't too far away he's David stops and picks up five stones that wasn't a revelation it's what he did every day um, that's how he kept the lions at bay and um, then he, he runs Try running in 127 pounds of bronze armor. No, David can dance around him. He can uh, and confuse him altogether. But the fact is, you see, that the Philistine headdress was um, came all the way around here, and it had a visor. You know, the ones that went up and down. And, and um, the only place that you could access his actual flesh was where that visor twisted, just there. There was a hole. That stone that David slung had that, that was its the only place in, right there. A and if he wasn't exactly, it would just bounce off the armor. That's why the guy was impregnable. That David slung his slingshot um, and let it fly, and one little stone was enough to get in that hole and knock him senseless, so that he fell to the ground. But I say he was alone. There was not a person watching that believed he would be alive in half an hour. I think Saul, the king, let him go almost to, to break the impasse. You know, at least something will happen and there'll be some sort of a fight. When, when David's, David was the sacrificial lamb, I mean, send him out there. The kid's got enough excitement to send him out. He's going to be killed anyway, that's obvious. But that will break it and then maybe we can fight like a normal. I don't know. But King Saul had no faith that David was going to do anything. And uh, I don't think there was a soldier there that could imagine that anybody could do anything. <clears throat> that's why they stayed in their place. And yet they did recognize that he represented them. <coughs> so every time David moved, it was as if the whole army moved together with him. He picks up the stones and every soldier in the place was picking up stones, as it were, because their life depended on that kid. And as he danced around Goliath, every soldier could feel. And yet, I mean, talk about holding your breath, biting your nails. <laughs> and when that stone let fly, he only had one chance. You can't stand there, hold still. Let me have another chance of this, you know. This is it. And when they saw Goliath fall, there is a stunned silence until they realize it's happened. And then they scream, we won, we won. Yeah, right, we did. <laughs> and... Uh, and, of course, when, when the Philistines saw their great champion fall, they turned tail and run. They'd never, there was nothing in their book or manual to say what happens when he goes, because he couldn't in their estimation. They were participating in David's faith imagery. That now the, the soldiers could... They could taste something of what David had been talking about. And, and they're, they're running now. They're becoming little Davids as they, they run to, to meet the Philistine army. 
Um, I, I find, and I'm, I'm finished now, but I, I find that today, of all days, I don't mean this day, I mean the days in which we live, um, we have the greatest, we're surrounded by darkness, an energy, an energy of darkness, it's palpable. Evil imagination and religious imagination that imagines <coughs> a false god and giving the response of fear and anxiety with no thought of being able to rise up and declare the glory of God. And I find that among us there, there, there is a loathing to trust <coughs> to commit I mentioned it a moment ago what David didn't do saying is God punishing us or is it his will that Goliath crush us or no you know, maybe God's teaching us something in all this yeah. or the person who says I can't impose my will on this situation, we just submit to the will of God and see what happens. In fact, is God's will was and is that someone trusts Him, joins their imagination to His, and that courage acts as if God is the covenant keeper. You see, the fact is, you, you, and I are the intention of God's love. You are. It's not some vague thing out there. And it, it's, it makes it pretty obvious this was no seminary trained person going out there. It was a, an absolute child that was going to face the impossible. So that includes everybody's social status. It includes intellectual the whole thing we're, we're the ones that God said of us eye has not seen ear has not heart has never ever entered into your imagination the things that God is prepared for those who love him Christ is your life he's your absolute identity and stop just echoing that as a religious wish list Spend the next six months imagining what that means in your life, that for you to be alive is Christ. And exchange our dead, empty imagination for the imagination of truth until we become what God says. Amen. We thank you, Father, that we are in the better covenant. We thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, that you are our life, you are our imagination. And awaken us to see what you see, to walk into our world, to be the radiators of your truth. Lord Jesus Christ, amen and amen.